I've bought some questionable, dumb things in my time, but the new 14-inch MacBook Pro is far from one of them. It's a complete refresh over its predecessors, bringing back the ports for the first time in five years, even more mind-blowing performance, and a dazzling all-screen 120Hz display, with a notch, but we'll get to that. But about a month ago, I finally upgraded from my old 2015 MacBook Pro to this wildebeest. And I can't think of the last time an upgrade in my life has been this worthy. But with that being said, this is not the laptop that most people should buy. The reason? It starts at 2000 USD. And so in this video, I'm going to be giving my thoughts on each aspect of the 14-inch MacBook Pro after one month of use, and whether it's the right laptop for you. And by the way, if you'd like to see something specific, the timestamps are in the description below. So starting off like always with the design, the new MacBook Pros have seen a complete redesign from the ground up. First off, the overall build this year is significantly thicker compared to the old MacBook Pros. The last generation focused on portability, hence the removal of the ports, and this generation just focused focuses on being the best laptop ever, no matter the heft. And it's definitely a noticeable difference, since it now packs in a weight of 1.6 kilos and a thickness of 0.61 inches. So no, it's not going to be as light or portable as last year's 13-inch MacBook Pro, but considering that you're getting a lot more, it is more than a worthy trade-off. Personally, I wasn't actually affected at all by this, since I came from a 2015 MacBook Pro, which by coincidence has pretty much the same weight and thickness. Plus, the additional thickness was well worth it for the ports being added back. Finally, they listened, and have now re-implemented ports that we haven't seen on the MacBook Pro since 2015. On the left-hand side, we have a headphone jack, two Thunderbolt 3 ports, and a MagSafe connector. And then on the right, there's an SD card slot, another Thunderbolt 3 port, and the HDMI input. Now, I hate to be a downer right off the bat, but if they were going to bring back a ton of ports for functionality, why not give us regular USB-A ports as well? This is literally one of my only complaints about the entire Mac, and it's not a deal breaker or or anything. I mean, the ports we have gotten back are obviously a step in the very right direction, but tons and tons of people still use old USB-A devices, including myself. In fact, that's the connection my mic uses, so ironically, I still had to go out and buy an adapter. Why? But again, the other ports on here are so great to see, especially MagSafe, which is something that my 2015 MacBook Pro had, and it saved my butt so many times. So again, great to see on here, thank you Apple. But due to how it slams into and abrases the against the metal beside the charger before it snaps into place, I do have a slight concern about whether this could scrape off the space grey paint over time. Not really a big deal, just something I was wondering. Now, one little knickknack of this machine is that it's actually got the words MacBook Pro engraved into the bottom, which is a really nice touch. They did not have to go out and do that since you'll almost never see it, but it's Apple, you know, attention to detail is what they do best. Now, on the aesthetic side, I'm going to be honest and say that when I was watching this laptop get announced, I was really a little disappointed about its looks, with the sort of half-flat, half-curvy features, but seeing it and using it in person, it is a lot better than they made it look on the screen. It's sleek, stylish, and the flat lid makes it feel very industrial and modern compared to the last generation, which was of course simply focused on being as portable as possible. Now, one area where this laptop destroys 99% of its competition is in the display, as it is a huge jump over what we had in 2020 and earlier. I mean, the first thing you'll notice is that now it basically takes up the whole area of the lid. This of course results in a much more immersive viewing experience, and the interesting thing is that this MacBook is basically the same size with the lid closed as the previous generation, but since the bezels have been shrunk, you're getting 14 inches of screen, not 13. But before anything else, let's cut to the chase and take a look at the elephant in the room, dun 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 dun, the notch. Now a lot of reviews are going to be mixed about the notch. Some people have said that they hate it, and you know, what were they thinking? While others, like me, think that it blends in quite nicely. Plus, since I mostly use my Mac in dark mode, I literally just forget it's there most of the time, since it camouflages in with the dark background. So despite its existence, it really does feel like an all-screen laptop. One quirk with the notch though, is that instead of bumping into it, like it does with the bezels, the cursor will actually go behind the notch if you move it up there. But you know, all in all, I'm easy, the notch doesn't bother me at all. But in terms of the actual quality of the display, we are in for a huge treat. First off, it's a mini LED panel, not LCD anymore, just like on the iPad Pros. In a nutshell, this is a very similar thing to OLED. In this case, the backlights are much smaller, so you'll be able to get those deep true blacks. Now, the actual specs of this panel are of course very high 
end. It's a 14.2 inch liquid retina XDR display with a resolution of 3024 by 1964 and a pixel density of 254 pixels per inch. So very, very high resolution as expected with a laptop you're paying over three grand for and anything you're viewing is going to look unbelievably crispy and vibrant with great colors and clarity as it's got one billion colors and a P3 color gamut. So for people like video or photo editors or anyone who works with color, this is a dream come true, as it's pretty much the most accurate in the industry in this kind of class. It also gets plenty bright as well, as it peaks out at a thousand nits, which is actually double what the previous 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro had, only 500. Obviously, 500 is still pretty good, but 1000 basically guarantees that you can work in any situation with lots of sun and you'll still be able to see what you're doing. And to top it all off, the 2021 MacBook Pros finally have a 120Hz ProMotion refresh rate, which makes every interaction leaps and bounds smoother, as the screen is updating what it's supposed to be showing at double the amount of times per second, compared to the old models which only cap at 60. I have really enjoyed using ProMotion on here. It makes the machine feel unbelievably responsive, not that it already isn't, but this just puts it on steroids. Now, as I've said in many of my other videos, a high refresh rate isn't an absolutely essential feature. It's not like 60Hz displays feel laggy or slow or anything, it's just that the 120Hz feels smoother. But to sum things up, this is probably the best display on a notebook out there, and so it's going to be a very helpful tool for anyone who needs to see what they're doing in the best way possible. Now coming back to that notch, there is a 1080p webcam in there, so we're going to quickly take a look at that, as well as the mic and speaker quality. So this is a raw mic and webcam test on the new 14-inch MacBook Pro. Um, obviously the new 1080p webcam is going to be leaps and bounds better than the old 720p ones, plus considering that there's also now a bigger sensor, so more light is being let in, plus the overall image quality is just clearer and better. And as for the mic, well, you can probably hear how good it is, I mean, it's just phenomenal, there's no other way to describe it. It literally almost sounds like a studio microphone, and that means that if I go away or something and I still want to record a voiceover, you know, I don't have to lug my mic around with me because I can literally just use the one on here. It's that good. And in addition to that, the speaker system on here is also just phenomenal. You could literally use these as your main music listening setup with no problem. These are easily the best speakers on any laptop. So let's take a quick listen. Now let's talk about the keyboard on here, which is yet another area that underwent some change for the new design. It now has a plastic backing, which to be honest I really was not a fan of when I was watching this get announced on the Apple event, but like the rest of the design, it's grown on me, and I now think I actually prefer this to the old metal backing. The keys themselves are very smooth to type on, with good enough travel and quite a lot of satisfyingness. Take a listen. But one minor gripe I do have here is that I feel like the travel is still a tad too little for my liking. I mean, obviously, it's nothing like the horrible butterfly keyboard that came before it, but since I came from a 2015 MacBook Pro, which has huge key travel, maybe I'm just still getting used to this one. But hey, just a very minor thing for me personally. All in all, it's a great keyboard, and I know that a lot of people will also think this because of the removal of the touch bar. Rest in peace, touch bar. You will not be sorely missed by the vast majority of people. But I mean, you gotta admit, it does look pretty cool. Although, in day-to-day -day use, many found it to be very inconvenient and annoying to use, since it has no tactility, and so, as a result of this, the touch bar has been given the axe and replaced with nice full-size function keys, which are far superior to that touch bar rubbish. Oh, and also, we have Touch ID to unlock the Mac on the right side at the end of the function keys. Unfortunately, no Face ID in the notch, but the fingerprint sensor is very quick and responsive on here, and for it to let you in, all you have to do is give it a light brush, and 
it'll know it's you. Now as for the trackpad, as you'd expect from a Mac, the one on here is pretty much again top of the industry. Not only is it absolutely huge, but it's also a force touch trackpad, which means that it's not actually a physical button mechanism, but rather several sensors underneath the glass that give off a vibration whenever you apply pressure to click. So it feels like you're pressing an actual physical button, but you're not. It's quite a strange feeling to get used to at first, but it is very useful, as you can click anywhere on the trackpad without it getting harder as you move up. Plus, you can take advantage of the pressure sensitivity to do things like hard press on a word to see its definition. Mac trackpads are really the best in the industry, and the one on here is no different. Next, let's move on to the inside of the Mac, specifically the performance, which is basically its main party trick. Although, considering how insanely powerful it is, I guess party trick would be a huge understatement. Now, there are quite a few configurations you can get here in terms of processor and RAM, but my machine has the base specs, the M1 Pro chipset with 8 cores and 16 gigs of RAM. Although, like I said earlier, I did upgrade the storage to 1 terabyte. But don't be fooled for one second by the words base model, because it most definitely doesn't act like one. This is the second generation of Apple Silicon for Macs, and if you thought that the first generation M1 chip blew everything out of the water, just wait till you see these. This Mac will just fly through anything you could imagine. It eats long 4K videos for breakfast, and washes it down with running a million things in the background. If you're upgrading from an older Mac, like I did, this will absolutely knock your socks off. I went from having to wait an hour to export my videos with the fan running at full blast, and the temperature at fever pitch, to having to wait no longer than 10 minutes. With the Mac staying at room temperature the whole time, and not a peep from the fan. In fact, I don't even know what the fan sounds like, because I don't think it's ever been on. I mean, either that, or it's just really quiet, which would also be a win-win. Bottom line though, no matter what configuration you get, this Mac will never let you down in terms of performance. And as you can see in this graph, these chipsets blow all competition out of the water. The only thing that really even comes close is the previous M1 Macs, and I know this is old news, but just look at how much of an improvement Apple silicon is over Intel. It just skyrockets the value for money here. But like I said at the start, this is not the laptop for most people. It's a performance powerhouse for those who need the most guts in their laptop for the most demanding tasks. And that goes for the base model version as well. You should only opt for more RAM, or even a better chipset, if you know you're going to be fighting demons with this thing. Now since the implementation of Apple Silicon chips in Macs, the battery life has also seen a drastic leap forward. This Mac can last up to days with light use, and and even on days full of intensive activity, it'll stay strong until nighttime. Personally, I average around 8 to 10 hours of screen on time between charges, which is just incredible, and it gives me the peace of mind that even if I didn't charge it the night before, I can take it to school and it'll be okay. Now surprisingly, a lot of people have actually said that this Mac has the worst battery life, and that the 13-inch M1 MacBook Pro from 2020, as well as the 16-inch MacBook Pro, both outlast this one. But like, if this has the worst battery life, then I can't even imagine how good the one with the best battery life would be, since the battery life on the 14 inch one is still very top end, and won't let you down in any situation. Now side note, when I bought this machine, I actually paid an extra $30 to get the faster 96 watt charging adapter in the box, and it's worth every cent. It fully charges my laptop in less than 45 minutes, so you know, it's only $30, and it'll go a really long way. And so that just about covers every little knickknack of the 14 inch MacBook Pro. And so the time has come to ask, is it the right one for you? Well, I have no doubts that this is more than worth buying for the extreme power user who wants or needs the best of the best, or at least in most configurations cases, not far off it. Of course, Apple is not joking around with the pricing here, as the base model 14 inch MacBook Pro literally starts, that's right, starts without any extras at $3,000 Australian, which is whopping. And that's without upgrading the processor to the 10 core CPU. And to be honest, I think that's pretty unfair how they did that. Not that the 8 core CPU is slow or bad in any way, it's just a bit stingy. Therefore, unless absolute top end features are on your wish list, or you need the most power for video editing, 3D animation, or running tons of things at the same time, you should steer clear of this Mac and go with something like the 13 inch MacBook Pro, or even the MacBook Air, as they are far cheaper and still offer amazing value for money. So bottom line, you should only buy one if you really need to or want to, you know, this is not the laptop for most people. And so that pretty much concludes my full review of the 14 inch MacBook Pro. This is the Mac for those who want the highest end everything. Display, performance, trackpad, keyboard, you name it. For me, the difference compared to my old 2015 MacBook Pro is just out of this world. I have really enjoyed using it and I'm sure you will too. 
If you enjoyed this video or found it useful in any way, please make sure you drop me a like and subscribe to TechSpree for more reviews, insights, and the occasional unboxing. Thank you so much for watching. This is Tom with TechSpree, and I'll see you as always next time.